All right, students, uh, this is our last video for topic 12.1. I'm going to talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, all right? Now, uh, we talked about wave functions and probability functions and so forth in the last video, okay? Um, the next step sort of in solving or uh, actually coming up with a way to use these ideas uh, was proposed by Werner Heisenberg, okay? And he discovered or invented, depending on your point of view, something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? And he basically said, okay, we know that it's not possible to measure simultaneously the position and momentum of a particle with indefinite precision, okay? Um, and he figured out a way to actually relate the two. He said that the uncertainty delta x in position and the uncertainty delta p in momentum are actually related by this expression right here. Delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi, h being Planck's constant. Note that if either delta x or delta p is zero, the other must be infinite because to solve for it, you'd have to divide both sides by the other thing, all right? So that doesn't work, all right? Um, this also applies to energy and time such that delta e and delta t is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. Both of these equations are given to you in your data booklet, okay? Now why is this? Don't worry about why this is because it's a fundamental property of nature and nobody has ever figured out why this is. It just is, okay? Now, this means, of course, uh, this is related to, obviously, the fact that particles sometimes behave like waves, sometimes like particles, okay? So, we can't divide them or classify them exclusively as either particles or waves, which we've talked about, um, we've talked about a lot in our class, okay? So, for example, as I said before, making momentum as accurate as possible makes position inaccurate and vice versa, okay? All right, now to understand why this is, I'm going to do a very, very simple derivation, a very qualitative derivation that's not mathematically rigorous, but will give you an idea of where this, where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle comes from. If you consider um, a horizontal beam of electrons, here shown by this blue cylinder, and it's, um, it's being beamed towards an aperture of a radius b, as shown, okay? When the beam is made very narrow, delta x, the, 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 um, the uncertainty in the position, becomes very, very small, okay? If you make it really, really, really narrow, so it has the same diameter as, as the aperture, di uh, aperture b, then delta x is, a, is approximately equal to half of b, okay? Now, if we reduce it even further, um, if we reduce it such that b becomes uh, on the order, on the same order as the uh, de Broglie wavelength, the electrons will diffract after going through the hole, okay? Because you know that diffraction occurs when the wavelength of the, of the wave is on the order of the size of the, of the um, opening or the object around, um, that, are, that are being hit by the wave, okay? So in effect, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle quantifies this, and here's how it does it, all right? Due to diffraction, there is a spread of um, possible places where the electrons could be observed on the screen on the other side. Okay? This should remind you of passing a monochromatic laser through a slit and looking at the diffraction pattern on the other side. Okay? Now, if we consider the spread of possible momenta on the other side, we could do this with, uh, we could do this with delta x if we want to, but in this example I'm going to use momenta. Okay, the spread would be an angular spread of two theta as shown in this diagram. So they can be from here to here, okay? And remember this is a three-dimensional cone, all right? Now the angle through which this occurs is um, from the angle for the diffraction of a, a, a laser through a slit. <clears throat> theta is approximately equal to lambda over b. Now, by using the small angle approximation here, okay, if this is delta p and this is p, we have that theta is also delta p over p, right? And I guess that's not really a small angle approximation. That's more of a definition of a radian. Um, but anyway, lambda over b is approximately equal to delta p over p. But since b was uh, uh, approximately equal to 2 delta x, um, if we solve all this, we end up with delta x delta p is approximately equal to h over 2, okay? So this derivation is qualitative and quite approximate because it doesn't have that factor of 2 pi in it, but it gives you an idea of how, the, of, of, of how Heisenberg arrived at his uncertainty principle, all right? As an example, go ahead and try this one. Let me show you. This is, this is uh, initially quite difficult. Um, to solve these problems, but when you'll see what's expected of you by the IB, you'll see kind of a formula for solving these problems, what they expect you to know. It'll be pretty straightforward. So let me just walk you through this one. 
We're going to use Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to figure out this problem. And to do that, we have to come up with values for delta x and delta p and so forth. Okay, so in this case, we're going to use delta x as 10 to the minus 10 meters, okay, um, because that's the slit opening. Now, actually, it's half that, but because everything is so approximate and what we really care about is the right order of magnitude, we're just going to call it 10 to the minus 10 meters, okay? So just considering the vertical and the y direction, we have delta x sub y times delta p sub y equals h over 4 pi. That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I'm going to solve this. And I'm going to use approximately equal signs instead of equal signs. Of course, that's not equal, but you know what I mean. Everything is approximate here. Delta P sub Y equals H over 4 pi delta X sub Y. And then I put in my values, and I get that the change in momentum, uh, the uncertainty in momentum in the vertical, is 5 times 10 to the minus 25 Newton seconds. Now, the momentum of the electrons, I just use our linear momentum equation we learned a long time ago. P equals mv. I get 9 times 10 to the minus 25. The electrons are deviated through an angle, therefore, according to the same diagram on the previous slide, of delta p sub y over p, which is a half a radian. Now, because they're asking where sort of how they fan out and the length over which they'll be observed, uh, we, have to, we have to convert uh, radians to a length, all right? And to do this, remember the definition of a radian, okay? Um, Here's the arc length. So really, 2 theta is, this is that arc length 2s, 2 theta. So um, if you solve this for, for s, you get that that's about 1 meter. This is what is expected of you in the IB. You don't need to do any more difficult um, quantification of this, I guess, uh, any, any, any more than this, because everything is so approximate. Really, this topic is more qualitative, and the math is really not that hard. Okay, I want to talk about the electron in a box model, all right? Now, if you think about an electron that's confined to a region of size L, okay? In fact, it can only move along a line L, okay? Uh, it's, uh, the uncertainty in its position is going to be L over 2. The uncertainty in momentum using uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is going to be H over 2 pi L. Make sure you understand that. Very simple algebra. The kinetic energy of this electron is going to be, as usual, P squared over 2M. All right? Um, but that's really delta P squared over 2M. Okay? And putting in my values, I get H squared over 8 pi squared M L squared. Okay? Now, why are we doing this? Because I want to show you in this example how the kinetic energy of an electron in a hydrogen hydrogen atom actually is the kinetic energy that we would expect um, by using this equation, all right? So putting in the values for the hydrogen atom, we get that the kinetic energy is 6 times 10 to the 19 joules, which is about 4 electron volts, okay? And notice that in this particular case, we assume the electron is confined to a space 10 to the minus 10 meters, as we always do with an atom, because that's about the, atom the distance, um, the length of the, of the diameter of um, any atom. We use, we use that value, okay? So the electron in a box model, what it really is, is it's a hypothetical description of an electron free to move in a small space surrounded by an impenetrable barrier. So really, it's an illustration. It's a way of showing the difference between classical and quantum systems. I want to talk just a little bit more about that before I move on and wrap up this video. So in the classical case, if you think about a ball trapped inside of a box that can move back and forth, Obviously, the ball can move at any speed within the box, and it's no more likely to be found at one position than another. In the quantum case, okay, when the box becomes very small, the particle, in this case an electron, it's much more likely to be found at certain positions than others, and that depends on its energy level. And in fact, there are certain places where it can never be detected, and these are called spatial nodes. Now, as a, to sort of show you pictorially, these are ideas of spatial nodes. Don't worry so much about these, uh, about what the blue lines mean and the red lines, but notice that they are, again, standing waves, standing probability waves, right? And there are places uh, along this length of L, this is the classical case, there are places where the particle would never be detected because of that standing probability wave. Pretty crazy stuff, all right? Now, the particle in a box model, to sum up, it's one of the very few problems in quantum mechanics that could actually be solved analytically precisely without using approximations, all right? And in your homework study packet, you'll see different examples of um, sort of how you need to work with the electron in a box model. Uh, mathematically, it's not super difficult, okay? And here's an example um, of how you would use um, 
the other version, I guess E delta T of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, give this one a try. Sorry, the um, example numbers are kind of messed up here in this video, but you get the idea, okay? So I have a decay, all right? The uncertainty in the energy release is 153 mega electron, uh, milli electron volts, sorry. Calculate the expected lifetime of the rho naught mason, meson, and, I, and hence identify the interaction through which the decay takes place, okay? So, Using Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, version 2, E delta T is approximately equal to H over 4 pi. I solve for delta T, all right? But delta E is, uh, and you know what? This actually should be mega, sorry, instead of milli. That should be mega electron volts. I don't know what's happening with that capitalization. Anyway, um, so let's see. I'm converting 153 mega electron volts to joules, and then I basically solve for T. Pretty straightforward. And remember, everything's approximate here. So I get t is on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. So remember from our studies in topic 7, really short lifetimes of particles usually indicate strong nuclear interactions. That, this is the depth which, with which you, uh, you need to be able to treat this um, topic. Okay. Last topic. This is super cool. This idea of quantum tunneling. Okay, this is a phenomenon where a particle tunnels through a barrier that classically it couldn't surmount. I'm going to start with a classical example for you, which is from your, uh, from your textbook, all right? Let's say you have a hill and you have a ball rolling towards the hill, okay? If the kinetic energy of the ball is in, even excluding friction, if the kinetic energy of the ball is less than the gravitational potential energy the ball would have at the top relative to the bottom, obviously there's no way, there's zero probability the ball would reach the other side and end up over here, correct? Well, in quantum mechanics, there is a way, there would be a way for the ball to actually get on the other side, and it has to do with the probability that it may actually get there. The hill, you can consider it to be a potential, a gravitational potential barrier. Now, in the case of quantum, if you think about, say, for example, um, a proton, which is the red circle here, has a total energy E sub t. It's facing a region of positive electric potential energy, which is region B, all right? Now, <clears throat> If the energy of the proton is less than Q sub E times V, all right, where V E, where V E is the electric potential in B, then there's absolutely no way the proton could get through B and um, end up in region C, right? So you can think of region C as a forbidden region, and region B would be the potential, the electric potential barrier in this case, all right? Now, it turns out that with on quantum scales, there is a probability that the proton could make it to region C. And the reason is because the proton in each region has its own wave function. Remember I talked about wave functions. A particle could have different wave functions depending on what state it's in or where it is, all right? So the proton would have a different wave function in each, in each region, A, B, and C, okay? And those wave functions have to join smoothly. They're, they are continuous waves. Uh, they are continuous functions, these probability functions. So clearly you can see from the diagram, there's a non-zero wave function in region C in order for it to be continuous with what it's doing in B. In fact, in region B, it's an exponential, uh, the probability is an exponential decay. In region A, you can see it's an oscillating probability, but in region C, it's small, but it's not non-zero, okay? So in effect, the wave function leaks into region C, and if there's a non-zero probability wave function in a region, it means that there is, no matter however small, there's a possibility that that proton could end up in that region. In this case, we say that the transmitted protons have tunneled through to region C. And there are a couple of factors affecting the probability of whether this would happen or not, um, which you just need to know qualitatively. The mass of the proton, the width of the barrier, and the difference in energy between the proton and the barrier, okay? So the larger each of these quantities is, the less likely the proton will tunnel into region C. And that wraps up quantum mechanics and tunneling.